And I heard him playing piano in the refectory, you know, in, the, in the main hall. Yeah, I had a, a sort of college band going on, needed a lead singer, I thought we could play the piano. And we invited you to come and rehearse and just carry on that. Ian, yeah, when was this? 1953. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was interesting. What I recall is that, yeah, I used to play the best time in you know, the refectory and stuff like that. And if I got this right, your lead singer fell in love and went to Denmark while you were in the middle of making a demo. And because you knew I could sing a bit, you asked me to come and do the vocals of the demo. That's how it kind of started. Yeah. So, what, what, did, did you have a band name before you were the New Hearts, or was this the beginning of the New Hearts? They had a proper band before. Yeah. Who was that? Uh, well, uh, we called ourselves the Splits. Splits Kids with a Z. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 they were really good. That's, that's, kind, of, that's kind of like uh, the cross between Split Ends and the Bridge Kids and the Sticks. Or the Heavy Metal. Gary, Gary, what's Gary Holmes? Yeah. yeah, you weren't in a band though. I had an amateur kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did, no. uh, am I correct in saying that you had a classical music education? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I played in orchestras and, and big brass bands. Uh, the, the trumpet. Yeah, probably, yeah. I played a few instruments, so mainly trumpet. So yeah, I was classically trained. So you met at college, and suddenly you find yourselves dynamically getting on. You know, and, and you start writing songs together, I assume, is that what happened? Yeah, I was already working, working on that with uh, John Hart, who was the next player. Yeah. And we put the band together pretty quickly. And on Wednesday afternoons, I used to be taught guitar by Mark Knopfler. And he taught English. And I think he was right, he taught geography. At my college, that the college. Yeah, it, 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 it taught me geography. Oh, right. okay, <laughs> taught me. I think the key thing, Eddie, is that his guitarist is quite well known now. I just remember as a geography teacher. And funnily enough, uh, as we were going along, he, he, he had his own band called the Cafe Racers, and I used to, I used to book the bands of that college. I used to book him just to watch him play guitar. And we formed New Hearts, and we'd started within eight shows in London. We were followed around every night by Maurice Oberstein, who was the chairman of CBS Records, otherwise known as Opie. Opie, oh, he talked yeah, about that. He, he, he had a very, he had cancer. Bob wax his tail, you get a record deal. That's right. So this yeah. guy was my boss at Polydor, and he had a dog that went everywhere. Charlie. Right. Charlie. Yeah, a big dog, and if he wagged his tail, you got a record deal. Is that true? That is true. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. I seriously didn't know that. But yeah, and he had this thing called comedy voice that went with it. So yeah, and he'd yeah. lift would come down, and sometimes Charlie would be in the lift. Yeah, he's going to have a Having is not fun. <laughs> so, um, we were just bowled over by the fact this powerful guy yeah. saw eight shows in a row, and then we were offered a CBS record deal. And it was a little too much, too fast, really, for yeah. us. And I went to Mark Knopfler in this prefab. Uh, classroom where he taught, taught us Wednesday afternoons and I said to, to Mark, I think I've been offered a record deal, what do you think I ought to do? And Mark Moffat said, no, 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 you want to stay at college, you get your qualifications, so you've got something to fall back on. <laughs> and, and I completely ignored him in some years and left college. And bugger me, six months later, he leaves college and he's got dire straits. <laughs> Cheeky butter. He gave me guitar lessons as well, and I said to him, don't be an English literature teacher, do geography. Yeah. Yeah. And it worked, because he did. So, so okay, so then now, we're in the New Hearts, we've got a record deal with CBS, and then we secured something. We got a jam tour, didn't we? Tell, tell me about that. 
because you did uh, not a lot of dates, but I think you're playing with them at Reading, uh, 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 and you suddenly became a really important band. And don't forget, there was no mod scene around at this time. There were a few bands like Blondie and, and Generation X and Buzzcocks that had mod things about them, but there was no mod scene. So tell us about what happened with you, Hearts, and, and where did it all go wrong, Mr. Best? Uh, uh, well, we signed up to the Cowbell Agency, who handled the jam and a lot of, a lot of those acts like the Stranglers and, and the Cure in particular. So we had, we had our foot in the door to, to get the tour support from CBS to pay into the jam tour, which is what you had to do. No one invited you, so we really like you to support them. Well, if they did, you better have your rubber company put a lot of money into it. And that's how it happened. Either it led to you having a hit, or it was pretty much a waste of time, but good experience. So we were put into that situation, and I think it was the inner city tour, wasn't it? Or no, it was no, the second one. The modern world tour. Modern world tour. The modern world tour. Yeah. The modern world tour. Modern world tour. And the funny thing was that. Uh, Along the way, I went to see uh, the jam at the Red Cow Hammersmith. Yes. Yeah. And I distinctly remember seeing punks leaping up and down and gobbing all over the jam mm -hmm. in their suits. I thought, oh, that's horrible. Mm -hmm. and, and, and along the way, by the time we did one support slot as Secret Affair, February of 79, at Reading University, you could see a lot of mods creeping around in the audience yeah. with the students and the punk element seem to have gone. See, Ian, you know, uh, I know that the band got kind of given this tag of being the leaders of the mod revival, yeah. but, but I suspect that the, the roots of Secret Affair came out of the end of uh, the new hearts. You know, you left two brilliant series and, and, and you had a bit of a following by this time. Were they kind of like mods, or were they just kind of semi-punk new wave kids? I mean, there, there were two other terms missing from it all, so I just start throwing the other. One of them is uh, new wave, yeah. and the, the, the latter one was power pop, which you know it kind of redefines a little bit what we were. Because what was different about us was, as new hearts, was that the singer sang in tune. The guitarist, <laughs> the guitarist who play the guitar. <laughs> you know, I mean, a lot of, I mean, I don't want to pull down the, the, the aggression, the passion, and, and the need to have to throw the music business around. But, you know, we were difficult, we define ourselves in a different way. And that's why we associate, we were associated with the jazz. Because they were one of the few bands that could play in. in but to I'm this, not so sure about the singing. What you just said, <laughs> you said, you won't be what you just said really does remind me of the seeds that you sowed with your debut album because mm -hmm. you created a world that wasn't punk, you know, that, that, that encouraged kids to dress up. You know, so when did you arrive at this fashion? Yes, the jam were doing it, and a few other, the Jolt from Scotland were doing oh, yeah. it, yeah. but not that many bands were doing it. And suddenly you're wearing suits, you're wearing cool, smart things. What, well, how did that happen? Well, actually, in New Hearts, we wore uh, tonic suits from charity shops yeah. into Secret yeah. Field. Other than charity shops, you couldn't get to Stripey school, you know, blazers, and, yeah. and, and and so, and I would wear things like school days, Brutus shirts. Yeah. So it's really a bit of a suede at like <laughs> school with the crombie and the velvet collar and, and the, uh, the brogues and whatever. And so we would wear things like that, but you'd be wearing ripped up jeans and converse baseball nuts. Yeah, which, which, is, which, are, which are rather popular these days. Exactly, <laughs> exactly what Ian said about power pop and new wave, because yeah. that was the look. They were kind of smudged together. You know, the pleasers and the records and all those kind of bands. The rich kids. And play. Well, rich kids. The, the, when we were putting Secret Fair together, there used to be a late night cinema circuit. And that, uh, if you didn't, if you could only go and get videos from, from video shops. But there was a whole. Uh, a circle of uh, 
late night, late night cinemas where the gate cinema which is still there in Notting Hill Gate. The Scala. The Scala and there's one in Chelsea, the, the Pullman. And, and you, you could see one director's films all through the night. So you went in there after the pub, you could drink and smoke in there. And one film that, that grabbed us was the was, was performance. I know, uh, I knew you were going to say that. said that before, because, because that is very the, big and one of the ultimate mod films, even though it might not be recognised as such. Mm -hmm. It was a massive influence on you, performance. So, so the band was have split up, and you've you've been writing songs for Secret Effect without knowing about the Secret Effect. So you use the studio time that you got from CBS That's to right. work on the new band without CBS knowing. Yeah. And then suddenly, in February 79, you announce the new band to the world. Mm -hmm. And you played one gig with the jam, yeah. the only uh, gig Secret Affair played with the jam. Yeah. What did you do after that? We got gigs through the same, through the, through the same agency. And so that month, we supported The Cure and uh, Pretenders and so on. So we were slotted immediately into the right place. And then at the same time, we're going around places like the Bridge House, starting off. So we did our own home show. So, so Ian, here's the thing, right? So famously, Secret Affair, Terry Murphy, yeah. Secret Affair started Mods Monday at the Bridge House. And you were followed by quite a lot, well, virtually every other band. There was only the Wellington and Waterloo, which was slightly after the Bridge House, as the regular mod night in London. Yeah. The Secret Affair started it. So, did you know? How did? What did you know about a mod revival? You know, because, because there was no mod revival then. There was just a load of kids wearing parkas or wearing suits, going to football and going to see bands like you. So, how did you know? <coughs> Built out of um, this cultural influence that the, the movie performance had on us, one of the very, very first songs that Dave and I put together in his front room at his house was Glory Boys, which had a lyrical content that just had the intention of of creating, you know, creating an environment and an imaginary world, you know, a concept, and I got to, you know, even. People don't believe me, but if that's just what I wrote. That's the lyrics were just what I wrote. That's what I wanted to write about. And lo and behold, a, a, a month later, I'm at the Barger Ground in Barking, and it's full of mods. You know? I didn't know about these kids that were dressing like the kids that you were imagining. Exactly. Well, can I just go back? Go go back to performance. There's so many bands watch that at late night cinemas. We saw it. Dozen times. When we were at the uh, late night showing at uh, Portobello Road, there was uh, our photographer, um, Fingerstello, Fingerstello, and he was there with Bob Geldof, who then did a photo shoot with him, replicating part with Mick Jagger spinning around the, the fluorescent tube. There were two members of the class sitting there, one of the mm -hmm. We were all there going, this is a great film. And there is a standout ballet linked to this that you, you may not be aware of. And I'm going to tell you now. I'll be aware. Breaking news. Breaking news. <laughs> Whatever the cops, the, the mod band. Now, let me just tell you. They started rehearsing in Tilly Street down by the river by HMS Belfast. And they were rehearsing the next room. And they were just starting off when we were well ahead of them. So we could hear what they were doing and they could hear what we were doing. And when we decided we loved the look of the South London gangsters, which was that very mod suited look, mm -hmm. which was Jane, James Fox and another very Anthony Valentine, one of those great actors. Mm -hmm. We uh, went down that road and thought that's the new look. That's why we did it. We never said we ought to buy mods. And years later, I, I know Steve Norman, the sax player, and, and, and Tony Adley quite well. And Steve Norman actually said, Do you know? that we were thinking, what should we dress like? And he said, we had seen performance and we thought we'd use that and have that look. And then we saw you on top of the pops and then bollocks. <laughs> right? And he said, dress like pirates. And so, <laughs> <laughs> I said to him, how did you 
go from wanting to look like South London gangsters in mod suits to wearing the kilts. And, and, and that's what happened. The interesting thing about New Romantics was that Spanner Valley started as mob band, Duran Duran did. That's all you need to know. Because they were shit, but Spanner Valley were quite good. So, um, so okay, so we now, we started Mods Monday. There's loads of bands around. You know, the jam off there somewhere doing their own thing. They've finally established themselves as a chart band after a very hard, long work, and you play with them loads of times. Suddenly, you're the new kids on the block. You, you, you know, you're the front page man of me. There's suddenly these journalists like Gary Boshaw and Adrian Thrills have realized there's something coming from the streets. And Thrills thought, this is great, it's a continuation of the jam. And Bushel thought, great, it's a working class movement that isn't controlled by Spengali's. Where did you fit in between those two kind of extremes? What can I just say about the title of the fight? Under interrogation, Gary Bushel admitted that he came up with Mod and Yule. And he gave us a front cover of the sounds, which is fantastic. When I interrogated him about this, he said, I have no idea which journalist called it the Mod Revive. To which I would say that no disrespect to what happened and the, the whole movement, but if you're starting a new band and you're teenagers and you think, right, we've got new arts wrong, we've got this great new album there, great band, we're going back out the road and we're going to be a success, no one would think, do you think, do you know what here, do you think we'll become successful enough to become part of a revival? No, but, but it's got negative no, it's it's small small this, is, this is very important because if you're a 15 year old kid right, who looks back to something that happened 20 years ago and totally rejects what's going on around you yeah. who gives a fuck what they call it who cares if it's called revival what it is is your life every day and you guys along with the chords and, and the purple hearts are the people showing us how to live that life I was a 15 year old the first time I saw Secret of Fame in fact the first time I, I met you again from school was in the Horse and Well, and you were having a band meeting in the posh bar. And I went, <laughs> that's Dave from school. Oh my God, he's from Secret of Fair. And I walked up and went, hello, do you remember me? He went, no, why? <laughs> and I said, but, 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 but we follow you. And you went, oh, we did go to school. And you told us your vision, Dave. Ian, you were sitting there dictating what the band was going to do, but you spent 10 minutes telling me what you thought you were going to do, and it changed my life. Oh. Have I never told you that before? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> See, man, take that bit out. <laughs> we're not like <laughs> tearing me on. <laughs> the significance of what Dave was saying, I think you're missing a, a subtle point, and it was the distinction between the word renewal and revival. Because the word revival became the stick with which the music journalists beat us with because rev revival is somehow retrogressive, non-progressive, is moving forward to music. Renewal is a rebuilding and a creation of something new. So it became a very, very key key phrase and we were often we were often bashed with that stick completely unnecessarily because it was a it was a time when the music press in particular had grabbed hold of the strange notion that they decided what young people wanted to like and wanted to follow and what friends they would take, rather than the actual creative people and the musicians and the people themselves. And I, I'm glad you said that because they wanted, especially the enemy, they wanted yes. the Mekons, the Gang of Four, That's right. intellectual Leeds based, Manchester based art rock, yeah. and you're giving them street anthems along with those other bands I mentioned a minute ago. Yeah. And suddenly, you Ian, particularly, not so much Dave, find yourself vilified <laughs> by the music press. Motor Mouth Page tells punks their shit. You know, just from that one line... That's not a direct quote. <laughs> no, I paraphrase. But just from that one line, we hate the punk elite. The, yeah. the amount of trouble that caused the band and you. I mean, do you regret? I know exactly what you meant by that, but maybe tell the audience what you did mean by that from time for action. Well, uh, unfortunately, I did write that line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't, 
restaurant is even first. I never had to reply to it. But the thing was that in New Hearts, where you, you come into the sort of punk uh, becomes a new wave, becoming yes, there are there are a lot of bandwagon jumpers, but we found that rather than being an open shop, an open door to people of any sort of talent or, or not, i.e. the punk revolution. We found it very much to be a closed shop, and it, it was very snooty. You had to be with the right journalists and the right people, and then you find that there are a lot of what, what you call middle class people in the record industry that want their slice of the punk cake. And it became something that, especially the music press, they could in those days just destroy you in, in just a number of, of uh, a number of reviews, bad reviews, because they've chosen to, to bring you down for their own reasons. Mm. And that's why in the end I thought, this is all really a bit of a joke, started by, in the end, Malcolm McLaren, who, who um, went out to New York to bring the New York, New York Dolls over to outrage everybody, to promote his brand with Vivian Westwood. And because when they came over, they were all junkies, basically. They were out of control, and he sent them all back to New York. And then that began the process of putting the Sex Pistols together. So, <coughs> in that was respect... You originally a boy band. So in that respect, because of how we were treated, I thought, yeah, we hate the punk league. It wasn't about the punks on the street. It wasn't about punks on the street. They had a lot of respect for what they believed in, what they wanted to listen to. It was the people behind it that were out for their little slice, business-wise. So, unfortunately, I should have added, uh, we ain't the punk elite, uh, middle-class business people, yeah, by the way, brackets, but I didn't. <laughs> we, 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 I, I think we do hear what you meant. But, here's the thing, right? So, you made that first single, and it burst its way into the charts. You made a brilliant video featuring probably the first Oh, by the way, standing in the shadows where the in crowd made. Oh, thanks, Dave. I'm in the in crowd now, standing mm -hmm. in that video. And yet, it burst into the charts. The first mod record in the charts. Well, further enraging the music press. Of course. All they decided that it wouldn't happen. They hated it. They went bonkers. They hated it. And yet, you have a street following, you have a working class following. Many of the kids at West Ham, you're from East London, many of the kids that I grew up with became what we call glory boys. Now, this is the thing that's always interested me, okay? So, you had a big fan base who used it, who came from the Barge Ground pretty much entirely and moved to the Bridge House when you moved to the Bridge House. And they adopted the name of your lead track. You know, the first track, you come on stage, you glory boys, yeah. and they chose this as the name of their gang. Yeah, they adopted it. Yeah, they adopted it. Yeah. So you were there before them, but what was it like having your own private army of kids who had to have literally one of two tattoos, one on the lip or one on the arm, the key on the arm or what's on the lip. Now people don't remember what it was like in, in the middle of 79 if you were part of that group. And I was on the periphery of that group. How was it for you? I'm not a big fan of myself promulgating my politics, and I probably anybody can guess where I sit with it all. But for me, the whole the willingness to adopt this emergence between mod, the, the, new, the new mod and what we were doing musically was what the music that influenced both both Dave and I was quite clearly within within that world. And, but also, when I saw this emergence happening, it occurred to me to think about the first time round. And the first time round, the early 60s, the first real generation of affluent teenagers, because of the war and rationing and all the rest of it, it was the first time when people could aspire, young people could aspire. And as opposed to you know, my objection to punk, as a philosophy, not music, but as a philosophy, because it was all about no, no, knock it down. 
Rome bastards. I hate him and I hate him. You know what I mean? I'm so bored with the USA. I'm so bored with you being bored with the USA. <laughs> you know? I got that even if they didn't. <laughs> and so, you know, what attracted me was the idea that aspirational, normal working people could create a culture around themselves that looked up and didn't look down. Don't look down. I mean, so, so, go on, Dave, you're going to say something. So, we've got Time for Action, and then you work on the LP. Now, Time for Action was an international hit. It wasn't just a hit in the UK. So, so suddenly you're not, vindicated is not, not the right word, but suddenly you're empowered by this complete generation of, let's face it, I was 15, 16 when it came out, um, but there's thousands, millions like me, funny enough to paraphrase the Purple Hearts. Um, uh, did you feel part of this community with, with, with that band and, and with the chords and with the Parkers and all? I mean, there was a scene, you were the leaders of it. How did that affect you? And I don't mean in a negative way with the music press. Yeah, yeah. With, with, you know, for example, the March of the Monster Tour, which didn't go as well as I suspected. So how was it to be the leaders of this thing and get your own label and sign some of the other bands? Thank you. Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> I could have said that, um, oh, I'm just trying to think what I would say. Um, <laughs> um, I, I'm trying Mrs. To try. Sherlock, not Mrs. Sands. <laughs> Sorry, that's a school joke, don't worry. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that um, what really happened with the focus on the What Revival tag is that because the band is concerned very different, you couldn't really kind of pin us all down to one particular sound. So the, so the chords, were, chords were fantastic and Purple Hearts, but they were so very different to what we were doing. And <clears throat> compared to Scar, well, with all due respect, when when if you look at Madness, they're the first people to say, well, we were huge fans of um, Prince Buster and Madness and, <clears throat> and all the other Scar bands. And the one thing that you could identify was the Scar beat, because that's what they all play. And it was so easy to market it, to sell it. And so in a way, it would appear that, that no one was gonna call it a Scar revival. But that's what it was. That's, that's exactly what it was. And so sort of it was presented and marketed to young people the same age as us as something new. You probably wouldn't have known in those days about the history of Sky Music. So they sort of got away with not saying, oh, it's the Sky Revival, that's all it is. It was so easy to market. We were difficult to market as some kind of force. <laughs> Uh, actually, Dave, I'm going to stop there because I knew Madness at the time and I knew Jerry Dallas later and they, would, Madness particularly, regarded themselves as part of the modern revival. You signed Laurel Aitken to your label, Scar and Mob were the same. They were the same. I don't care what anyone says now. Mm. The change came towards the end of 79 when Skinheads literally appropriated to turn. And, and then it changed, and it became much easier for the press to say, Tuta, great, Mod, we can't really understand this. But, but we, yeah, we, suddenly, we were out in the cold. Yeah. We did double headliners with Madness. We all got on great. Some sense to this day, there we, we all got on great. And somewhere down the line there, people decided that uh, a Mod audience has to be different from the Scar audience. When all those teenagers, we were teenagers, you bought all of the records. Yeah. You bought the specials. You bought the jam. You bought the chords. You bought the secret affair. Yeah. And, and, and there was this division that was created where we were kind of shunted to one side as, well, we're going to the front pages, but it's 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 unfashionable. But we're gonna we're gonna dump on that. Yeah. Ian, why did it become unfashionable? Uh, following on from what Dave just said, it, it, this, this is my this is why? my theory. It's just my theory. Prior to punk, new wave, blah blah blah, um, through the, the, you know, the early half of the seventies, the, 70s, the
The dominant force in forces in music were what were known as supergroups, Spadia Rock, and Melody Maker, which at the time was the leading newspaper, not anything, and called, called it up, didn't it? Through punk. Yeah. Uh, but there was a huge amount editorially vested in these big supergroups who were taking all the money. Um, so th there was a lot of angst within the music press editorially. Uh, I, can, I can remember it. Uh, whether, uh, as to whether they were willing to cover punk and new wave at all, because it, it so directly contrasted with their vested interests. Completely. Having made the decision to do it, an enemy in sound, I think, probably the first. Uh, actually, Caroline, Caroline Coon of Melody Maker, I think, was the first to yeah. really write about the Sex Pistols. But having vested so much, and then throwing off their, you know, straightening out their perms, and throwing off their silk jackets, and putting on a motorbike jacket, and, you know, and all the rest of it. It was a big decision for them. And then two years later, some 18 year old kid says, nah, no, nah, you don't want all that, you want this. And they weren't having it. Yeah, you are absolutely 100%. And there is a very famous article that appeared in the anime by the guy who was in, I think, the Pink Fairies, I can't remember his name now, where he put, this will not last. These kids are standing 200 yards away from a bloke, they're paying 20 pounds to, get to, to see some fucking twat in a, a cape standing 200 yards away in Angular Lark. I can't remember the bloke's name, but you're absolutely 100% correct. And so you, you find yourself. Well, okay, no, we'll go back a bit because you released the Glory Boys, which mm -hmm. became the anthemic record for people like me. Mm -hmm. So, suddenly, you're in the charts, you're fated, you're given your own label by Arista, mm -hmm. you sign Squire, you're, you're part of this fabulous scene that, that, you know, gestates through maximum speed and a few other fan things shake. Um, but, but, so suddenly, you're cock of the walk, and then you wrote your best tracks. Yeah, well, I don't know. We were we were lucky in one particular way for all that spiteful motor mouth stuff. And it was, was spiteful, yeah. and, and a lot, a lot of it was not just not true. Um, what, bu what bugged everything up and allowed us to progress with other songs, what really bugged them up was that A, we were a chart band, yeah. we were on top of the pops, and after a lot of hard work, I did a lot of hard work myself from the aspects of it, Radio, Radio 1 and the BBC loved us. And yeah. back then, that was how you got successful. Yeah. You had to get top of the pops, and you had to get on the, and you had to get on the playlists of the various DJs throughout the day and the evening. And there are still quite a few people that, that, that think Time for Action went to number one because it was heard like a number one record because it got played all the time and it sold a lot of copies. 285,000 million. <laughs> not for that 285 million. In fact, it's probably not 285 million. I thought, I thought it was 250 million. <laughs> um, we, 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 we had, we had, tell me about we had, by the way, it was John Peel that really kicked us off. Why did John Peel write them on the phone? Well, he loved that Manchester Leeds, you know, art rock thing, and then he embraced them on the way. And how? Well, did you speak to him at the time? Yeah, um, at Arista, we had uh, a very, very strong promotions plugger lady. And part of my job for the band with Radio 1 was so uh, we would go, uh, we would tour around and visit. And I used to meet in the BBC bar at near White Bush House. No, well. Yeah, every, every DJ, and importantly, every DJ's producer, because people always think that it's the DJ's producer of records, it isn't. The playlist is made up somewhere else and the DJs were just playing what they were told. And we had a very, very good uh, promoter in that. And uh, I met John Peel and we went out one night uh, we got him really drunk, <laughs> and um, and he really had a good time. Which he hadn't done it because he wasn't the sort of person that did that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely, the other DJs were, and he just sort of liked us. And I can remember 
talking to him, he got what we were doing. And I think some of this sort of the pseudo-political working class thing penetrated his perception and, of what we were doing. And none of them were working class, by the way. That's right. So, Dave, I changed the subject to find out about how you got an orchestra to play on my world, which, for me, all right, time for action, I'm in a video, I've got a tattoo, but my world, that's all right. Well, Ian asked me to tell the name, though. Go on. How <laughs> <laughs> I wrote my world. Around about that time, I lived in the middle of Epping Forest. High Beach. High Beach, very nice. I mean, it's free. Not, not <laughs> as nice as. Uh, <laughs> I can't remember where you lived. Obviously, Rogan Valley. So, do you remember? You lived in Rogan Valley, obviously, the stage. That's years later. I was living in the back. I came round for an interview. Where did you live that day? Well, I, I, it was just reminding me, around that time, from New Hearts, I had a great big stage and a fend between, hugely loud amplifier combo. And I managed to get a lead made for the guitar that went out of my bedroom upstairs with the windows open into the amp, and it went all the way over a little barbed wire fence into the farmer's field and up by the woods. And I used to stand there and play my Fender Telecaster, which I've still got to this day. And I'd play it, and I'd have it loud enough to come coming out of the house. And I had no idea why my mother put up with it. And I was surrounded by the audience, probably from that song as well. Cows and sheep. No, no, March hares. Uh, and they used to sit like that. <laughs> they used to sit there and I'd play to the hairs. And then my mum at lunchtime would come out in the garden and ring a bell for lunch. And, and I'd hear this ding 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 and I knew that was lunch. Was it tea or was it dear? Come back over the bar wire, right, okay, sit down in the vegetable patch. And, and that's how that came about. Dave. I'm guessing he's not going to worry about this. Um, so, <laughs> we have... It, oh, let me just say... Come on, Dave. Come on. It, 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 it is... That song is just an anthem. It's about optimism, about leaving your home, leaving the nest, and what you may or may not achieve in your life. It's so beautiful. And what I like... It's amazing to me that all these years later, you guys are here, that I'm still playing it, we're still playing it, and we get the whole crowd singing along. We've all had our ups and downs, we've all had, we've all lost people, but it's still there as a, an anthem of optimism. And now we've got through COVID, let me just finish. <laughs> let me finish. Right. I was just going to say, give Dave a round of applause. <laughs> let me finish. Will you run it, please? And now we've got through COVID, having lost the one of you, Tony Morrison, the guitarist, and the great friend. Mm. Uh, and Tony Perfect. Tony Perfect. Oh, and and we, when you get to the end of all of this, and I sung for this, the, the, the um, Skegness Scooter Rally virtual rally, which was cancelled, and I got hooked up somehow, I don't know, Tracy did it, and I, I had a QA and a then, and I performed it and sung it for the virtual Scooter Rally. And so when you get through all this, now, just as you think everything's going well, we can't heat our homes or switch the light bulbs on. So, let me tell you, you're gonna, let me tell you, it can only be a couple of months from now where I'll be in my front room again, freezing cold with the heating off, covered in an overcoat, and I do the singing, this <laughs> is my world. <laughs> so, and, and when, surrounded by hairs, yeah. <laughs> and when the last candle snuffs itself out, like I shall that. take my frozen hands, pick the guitar up, and I'll play my world one last time. So listen, we've got 10 minutes left of this Q&A, but are you having a relatively interesting time so far? Yeah. So don't forget, this album, so somebody put on like some stupid monster. 
Why would I want another secret affair compilation? I'll tell you why. First of all, I did it. <laughs> Second of all, it's on vinyl. Okay? Every other secret affair compilation that's been ripped off by their former record labels, they're just CDs. So if you want to hear the glorious, glorious history of one of the best bands I've ever seen, you get off Tracy over there. And in fact, Ian might have moaned, but he's signed a few, so <laughs> you can get a signed copy. Right, we've got 10 minutes left before. So, the thing about the questions from the crowd, don't forget, you have to shout them, say where you're from and what your name is. I repeat it and then the boys answer it. So, before we get there, we have 10 minutes. So, Ian. What would, you like to, <laughs> what would you like to talk about to the young people? Uh, I'd just like to uh, give a, a, a highlight, if you like, just talking about the conversation. I hope I'm not boring you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is, um, I need my thick ear in a minute, as my dad would have said. Is, is the, the musical value of the band within within any context. Part of my resentment about that the music press stuff was they completely ignored the, the, the musical content. On purpose. And, yeah, yeah. And, and the competence of the band. We were always, I mean, if I, if I don't say any rules, we were always very good. And blessed by a, a guitarist um, with, a, with an utterly, especially for our first of the running out there, an utterly unique approach to playing the guitar, which I, I, I found to be innovative, and I'm not really a, a guitarist anyway, completely impossible to understand. <laughs> I would watch his fingers, on, you know, when we do our writing sessions, I'd look at his fingers and go, what the earth are you doing? You know, it's like some kind of weird Chinese puzzle at times, that he would create chord shapes, Cool chips that lots and lots of people don't use. Uh, it helps me answer the other half of Eddie's question about the string section of my world. Yes. Yes. The string section of my world was something I wanted to do. You were a little skeptical, as I recall. Um, but I could hear in Dave's guitar part an orchestra. I always want people to be taught generally in the band. I always say to the rest of the band members that the guitar of Secret Affair is the orchestra of the band. All of the production ideas, you know, we do, we do some pretty big productions, come from Dave's guitar. And I take his bits and I nick them and give them to other instruments sometimes to do chagrin. You know, I mean, on the Glory Boys, I'm in the middle break, I'm playing his guitar part and I have to call it. You know, so the musicality of the band, I think, often got. Uh, overlooked, and I've got to admit that the whole mod my asthma was the obstacle to that because they were so desperate to ignore it, that we were a superior band. It wasn't at first, and then they used it as a stick to beat you. That's right. And, and, and I, you know, as a 16, 17 year old following the band from gig to gig, it was heartbreaking to see because without a doubt, you were the most professional, fabulous. But you know, uh, the original lineup lasted four years, and I don't mean the lineup with the drummer that played. Mm -hmm. um, but this lineup has lasted pretty much 15 years. So, do you enjoy oh, playing together? I mean, you two are like an old married couple. <laughs> you are. Whether you like I'm sorry, I don't. Yeah, no, I saw your face. I did tell you. Yeah, no, and I know you probably don't want to hear that, but you two are joined at the hip. You know? Oh, are they? Oh, did I yes. step too far? Right? Yes, they are. Listen, let's just go back <laughs> to your original question about the orchestra. <laughs> because <laughs> you, missed the, you missed the key I thing here. The of course, is I that because we had a, a lot of money at our disposal at that time with a hit song, that Ian at some point said, let's put an orchestra on my world. And yeah. You said, I'm going to write a score for this. And I did think, can he really do that? <laughs> and so they went to the expense of a 16 piece. 16 piece. <clears throat> and they assembled. We'd already recorded the track, obviously. And we were at uh, a studio in uh, Westbourne Grove. And they all came in, and I stood there. 
and watched Ian, you were only, what, 19? 19. 19, he handed out the score to all these session players. And I thought, God, what on earth is going to happen next? And, and it was brilliant. And, and I, I listened to it and thought, my God, I never knew you had that kind of talent. And then he, Ian got them to, you know, these session players to record it twice, which you're not supposed to do that with uh, classical musicians. So that's why it's got that really great full sound. Yeah, double track. <clears throat> and years later, when things weren't going too well, the, the song that, that, that got away was One Day in Your Life. And One Day in Your Life is almost a sister song to my world. And we did not have the, the, the funds or the clout anymore to record it up in London with a similar uh, orchestra. It, it, it was a real crying shame. Yeah. Well mm -hmm. done. Yeah. Absolutely. I've almost got a tear in my eye. Father, we're not asking questions yet. Why are you standing there asking questions? We have five minutes. Five minutes of our QA. You can go away. So, um, when, when you got the band back together, and I mean the new band, you know, 15 years ago, did you think, that, that, did you do it for a one-off, or did you think, look, this is my life, I'm going to continue doing this until I die? Because 15 years later, you're still doing it. And if I hazard to say this, the band are as good as I saw them at the Bridge House in 1979. They're absolutely, with the new musicians and the brass section, you know, you didn't have a brass section before, you had you and Winthrop play trumpet versus saxophone, and the, the, the dueling, I mean, who on earth would have thought about having a trumpet dueling with a guitar? So let's briefly, before we open the microphone to Farmer, um, <laughs> who would have thought about the duel, the duel in Mods Maiden, going to a go go and um, I'm not free, but I'm cheap. I mean, that is you. It was your idea. It was your idea. In fact, come on. I'm a trumpet player, but it was just my idea. It was. It's, it's still incredible, and it's live. So, how do you feel about Mods Maiden now, 45, 43 years later? Your performance. All of it. I don't mean the five tracks or the four tracks or whatever it was. I mean the whole recording. Well, I don't know what happened, but with, with Ian and his connection with um, Tower Motown, I'm born on the Towers in Small Faces. Yeah. Also, by the way, he was slagging off uh, um, prog rock bands a little earlier. Yeah, oh, well, I just want you to let you know. He was I want to let you know the that, my, that my brother took me at the age of 12 to see Emma Slake and Palmer at the <laughs> London Pavilion <laughs> down the truck of the Earl. Okay, on with it, Ken. And effectively, <laughs> when we were asked out of the blue, so because I was connecting about these all these different products over the years we, we weren't playing and we were invited to the Isle of Wight scooter rally to play uh, on the ice rink and we put together Ian said well let's put a horn section in this just for the hell of it and we didn't realize we were playing actually on ice <laughs> and I foolishly thought yeah. They took the ice out and put some boards down. Whoever's been there, anybody here has been there, they put a tarpaulin down and it slowly melted until it was like crushed ice. And it went from being dripping on all the electrics from when we were sound checking in, in sort of overcoats to when we went back, it was a sauna, you could barely see the audience. And we were in, this is the first time we, we reformed pro, uh, with a new band, rather, which was 14 years ago. And the guy, Steve Foster from VFM, the promoter, he came and he said, well done, you sold out, there's 2,500 people out there. And we're surrounded by ice skates. <laughs> and I said, what? Fuck. And, and, that, that, and then about two or three weeks after that, the early days of, of um, a website, we got an invitation to play, to play Moscow. I thought, oh, Moscow. 
uh, which was to, when we played Moscow, there were like 1,500 young teenage mods who'd finally been allowed to do. And then we got invited to Japan, and then, and then you just thought, well, why not just carry on to where we are now? And, and we're so and we're very proud to have AGMP, I think Adrian's at the back there, who has raised our game over the years where we actually go out on tour like we used to. So thank you. Now, farmer, where are you? So we have um, 10 or 15 minutes where you have to shout at me and I tell you to bugger off. However, off you go. I just want to know the, the uh, images we've got behind you now. There's a lot of these I haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. like, we've all known each other for 40 plus years. A lot of these images we haven't seen before. I don't know if the other people here. We've all been together for 40 plus years. I'm wondering if you're going to collect this and actually get these out to, to your fans. To now, I have to repeat that. So that's Andy Farmer <laughs> from Friendly Park who says, I love. The artwork behind you. Yes. Is there an idea to collate all the images from the band's career into a book? Mm. Into a book. Well, he didn't say that, but I just, you know, paraphrase <laughs> Jesus, come on. No, I don't feel published anymore. So, Ian, Ian, go and sit down. Ian. The, the way to do it would be, uh, and there's never been a, a secret affair book endorsed by us, the band, you know, and I am a writer. Uh, Dave and I have discussed a number of times, not recently actually, but a number of times, about whether we wanted to do it or not. Do we think that's a good idea? Yes! yes. I'll tell you what the reservation is. In order for it to be an accurate and good book, I'd have to say things about some people that I don't think it's right to say. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't think I'm trying to be as diplomatic as I can. You need an editor. Yeah. Right, okay, so there might or there might not be a book. Right, who else has a question? This lady over here, you have to stand up though, we can't hear you. And this is Mandy, and she, fly me. That was an anchor. I'm Mandy Fleming. That's a difficult question. Mandy wants to know if you were starting out now a secret affair, how would you go about things? Well, I, I, I thought about this a lot actually. That I think A, make sure you. <laughs> Like Mark Luffer told me, get your qualifications first. <laughs> That's the first thing I'd say. Right? And learn geography. Get yourself a. Because you, you, I, I just believe, obviously, that social media uh, can be an incredible force. Um, and I, I think if I was managing an act, I think I would have to start with saying what we need to do is get a, a proper booking agent behind this band. Because the booking agent, Cowbell, who work for, um, they slotted us straight in to support slots with the pretenders and the cure, and that gave us a head start, and in this day and age, I would be thinking, I've got to get my band exposure through, not only social media, but I've got to find an agent that will take them on, not a record label, but do you, think, time. Dave, do you think that there is a live circuit you can plug into? You mentioned AGMP who are probably the last great independent promoter that there is, but you know, what happened to all the little venues at Secret Affair Play or the New Hearts Play when you were starting, they're all closed. You know, we were in the Hundred Club, one of the greatest British venues since the 1930s. They tried to close this two years ago, you know? And, and, and it's just so hard to, to do what they did now. Now, we have oh, time for three more questions. Who have we got? Right, you over there. Small venues. Small venues. Yeah, so we're in Cambridge. 
<laughs> so, it's one, of, it's one of my favourite venues. That question was, you came to play in Cambridge and it was really good, and then coming back. Thank you. Can I, can I just tell you, if you're from Cambridge, tell you that we're actually about to announce playing the Cambridge Junction on December 28. Yay. Right. There is somebody over there. I it's very dark over there. I'm going to get that one there. Go on. When I played the Children of you had Seb Shelton with you as well. Um, I'd like to know, or uh, ask why he left, and how did you feel when he turned up with Thunderings? Yes, you do know. I can tell you that we had no idea that he was uh, thinking about getting away from Secret Affair, which was on uh, second album tour, concert hall tour, and he would obviously been in conversation with uh, Dexies, so he, he was just waiting to finish our tour and then go. I have to say, I came off at Glasgow Apollo, which I think they've they, taken it down and we came off it was a very successful concert hall tour and I went backstage and um, I just said I thought that was a great gig and he said something not very nice and he threw a glass of orange juice in my face did he say <laughs> I have come and I mean so I'm dripping in orange juice I don't know why he picked it's on me, I'm but trying to bring things it's to not, I'm just saying, the way he left, that's not exactly very rock and roll, throwing orange juice on this. Your point, your point is one of the things we know, within the band, we knew this stuff, he was one of the strongest advocates of being a mod, mob star. Was yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. 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 surprised. Yeah. Yeah. And there is, there is a pair of dungarees. Dexies, Dexies did start as a mod band, as you well know, you know, when they support the Purple Hearts and the, and the Electric Ballroom. Mm -hmm. They were all dressed as mods. Yeah. It changed. Now, we've got time for one last question. Hey, hey, hey. Who said that? Me. No, whoever that Me. was, no, right. that person. Right. Question. Not you. Right. Is the secrecy behind no. those that? doors? When you guys like release behind closed doors, mm. there's a, this conspiracy that you everyone's up that you close down everything and stuff like that. Was that true? No. Right, that question. <laughs> Behind Closed Doors is called Behind Closed Doors because it was a secret affair. Right, now listen, because we've run out of time and the band has to be back on in about eight minutes. No, that person over there that has been putting his hand up for an hour and a half. No pressure. It's composers, what makes it? Oh, Jesus. Subjectively. I didn't hear it. What was the question? Having the word, we hate the punk for me. I think, <laughs> I think uh, from my perspective, great songwriting is made out of respect for discipline, structure, sensitivity, and the ear. Or an, what Dave and I used to do a lot when we made music was we would imagine what the song would f sound like before we'd written it. Glory Boys was written like that. And then Dave would come to me with a bit of thing, and I'd say, oh, I've got a bit of thing that goes with that bit of thing. And, but we already had a roadmap. And you, it's like writing a novel. You can't just write a novel and say, and then suddenly a knife plunged into his back, and he fell, expect you're gonna finish that book. Because when you finish that book, you've got to know where it ends. And we often know where our songs are gonna end when we start writing. Dan, the longer you spend, Write the song, worse it gets. the worse it gets. Time for action on a bass guitar in 10 minutes. That's all you need to know. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have Ian Payne's, Dave Kelly's, Good Night and Good. We're going to change the stage around and we're going to get the music.